Matika Wilbur is visiting over 500 nations for her Project 562, which stands for the number of federally recognized tribes of its inception in 2012. There are now 575 federally recognized tribes. Through conversations, portraits, exhibitions, and her popular podcast, All My Relations, Matika explores contemporary indigenous identity. Michelle Hernandez and welcome to He Bulb Conversations. With us today is Matika Wilbur. Welcome Matika. <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Uh, tell me about you. Let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? <laughs> well, um, good afternoon relatives. Uh, my name is Matika Wilbur and I'm from the Swinomish and Tulalip tribes. And I am um, I'm the daughter of Kenny Joseph from Tulalip. And my mom is Nancy Wilbur from Swinomish. And Loretta James was my grandmother. And I was born in Anacortes. And I was seven pounds, eight ounces. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> my baby was just born. She's also seven pounds, eight ounces. It runs in the family. I think that's a really strange thing about American culture. We're like, well, how much did she weigh? It's like, we really want to know the size of this child. <laughs> but yes, I was, I was born in April and uh, I'm a Taurus, you know, <laughs> just important information. Yeah. <laughs> do you have siblings? I do. I do have siblings and, um, yeah, they torment me. Oh, <laughs> no, just, I'm just kidding. No. I have, um, I have two sisters, Sheena and Jessica and, and my brother, Wolfie, Tandy, um, Swinomish. And I have a stepsister, Joey, and I have a slew of uh, nieces and nephews. And so that's good. I, I love auntie life. I recently, it's the best, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I recently became a mom. I have a baby, Alma B, and last month I was married. I married Congratulations. Nino. Thank you. That's exciting. And um, yeah, so. Where did you go to school? I went to school in La Conner, okay. at La Conner High School, uh, K through 12. Well, actually, you know, I went to, um, I went to Immaculate Conception, which is a Catholic, a private Catholic school for a bit until they kicked me out. In Mount Vernon? Yeah, in Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had read, um, I was like going through a rebel phase. I had read God is Red. Did you get out of that phase? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, <laughs> I didn't. I, I, you know, I don't know what my mom expected. My mom had a Native American art gallery when I was growing up in uh, La Conner. And so I was really like a shop girl, like a shopkeeper daughter and after school after practice I'd walk down to the shop and she had all of this you know like this incredible reading mm -hmm. uh, because it, of course it wasn't accessible to me in public school we don't we still don't teach a contemporary native curriculum but um, Vine Deloria had all of uh, the, his books there and I read God I was like doing a vine tour I was a like a voracious reader as a teenager and and, uh, and uh, between reading Jack Kerouac and uh, Vine Deloria, I was like set off on a wild rebel phase and I read God is Red and then went back to school and started my own like personal protest, you know, like I refused to do this catechism and um, I felt like it was just recolonizing me all over again and I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and I was like cutting my skirt and painting my nails and protesting and so they kicked me out. Okay. So that's my pub, my private school story. But yeah, I went to um, I went to school at La Conner, and that's where I graduated from. And I eventually went to Brooks, which is uh, a small liberal arts uh, art school in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And it was so fun. And I studied photography and filmmaking and advertising. And I thought I wanted to be in commercial photography. So that's what I studied. But that ended up not being the route for me. And when did you come back home? Um, I came back on and off for a number of years, you know. After after college, I was in Los Angeles and I was studying commercial photography. And so then I thought I was going to go into celebrity photography. And I interned with all these really cool photographers and was like really in the mix, like my and wearing high heels and in Beverly Hills and like doing the whole thing. And, and um, I found the whole experience to be quite unrewarding, actually. I... Um, I remember when I was, I, I did this whole um, photo shoot with, oh, I was just the PA. So it was just a, a you know, not, I wasn't like, it wasn't my photo shoot. And um, 
we ended up, it, we photographed a lot of white women, you know, and a lot of really skinny white women mm -hmm. to sell products. And I remember like getting off on Sunset and La Brea and looking up and seeing my work, um, our projects, you know, up there on billboards and realizing like, oh yeah, this isn't, this isn't for me. <laughs> I, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, so then I got a, I did an internship with Round Earth Productions and I moved to South America and I started shooting indigenous people there. Um, and I was in the Sacred Valley in Oyante Tembo and I was photographing um, a bunch of Kuchan people and it was so cool. I had a, like I really learned a lot about documentary photography because I had really studied commercial photography. So it was kind of a big eye opening experience to think like, oh, man, I could do journalism or I can tell stories in a way that helps people. And we had done this whole project. We were photographing people who had uh, grown corn for the United States market and the United States had a promise to subsidize corn that was that was being grown for fuel at the time. Mm -hmm. And then we changed our minds uh, as a country and decided not to subsidize the global market. And all of these farmers, these indigenous farmers around the globe right. were starving. Yeah, they did that with tuna fish too. Yeah, starving. They couldn't eat their corn yeah. and they couldn't sell it on the global market because they couldn't compete with the subsidized market. And um, it was like one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. Because I, you know, because we don't live like that here. Right. We don't have that kind of poverty, especially here on this res. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it was really uh, something to see. And so then um, well, it was while I was doing that project that I realized like, oh, yeah, I should probably go home and start photographing my own people. And, and so that's when I came home. I don't know. I'm bad with years. Yeah. I was about 23, maybe. 20-ish. In my early 20s. <laughs> I was in my early 20s, that's for Got sure. <laughs> yeah. And I moved back to Seattle and I opened a studio in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And then um, Urvana Little Eagle came to a show. Oh, I did an exhibition called We Are One People. I photographed a bunch of different Coast Salish yeah. elders, including elders here in Tulalip, which actually hang in, uh, in the admin building. Some of them do. And then that was shown at the Seattle Art Museum. And then Urbana Little Eagle, who teaches at Heritage, came to the show and said, hey, you're from here, you're a photographer. I would love if you would come down and work with the kids. Yeah. And so then that's when I started teaching at Heritage. And how long did you do that? I think until I was like 29. So I had the photo studio. Yeah. And uh, it was a number of years, four years maybe. Yeah, I had met you when you first had come back to do that project okay. with our seniors, I think, before you were teaching at Heritage. Yeah. Yeah, before I was here, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so it was really fun. It was, um, I learned a lot being a teacher. You know, I didn't really, I didn't aspire to teach, so yeah. it was a big learning curve for me. Sorry. I was like, oh, God, I have to work with kids. And I was a kid myself. You know, I had no idea what I was doing, but Arvana and Marina and Shelly, Mm -hmm. uh, Shelly Lacey were so uh, helpful and kind and really taught me a lot about how to work with kids. And, yeah. and I learned a lot from the kids too. And they were naughty um, and so much <laughs> <They're> fun. They're teenagers. <laughs> naughty yeah. teenagers, but so much fun. You know, I really, um, I think it really helped me to feel grounded and connected to community to spend time with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's something you can always look back on. Yeah, I'll definitely look back on it. <laughs> Are you saying you're not going to do it again? <laughs> no, actually, I love, I go down to Heritage. I did a project with them last year. We, I was working with the podcast and um, piloting some curriculum there. And yeah. and I'll, I will always go back to Heritage. I have a real soft spot for Heritage. Yeah. And, 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 um, yeah, I taught there a little bit, too, with Artist in Residence program. Oh, did you? Yeah, it's a special group of kids. It really yeah. is. Yeah, it gets a bad rap in the community. Yeah. But I think that the teachers that are there are really dedicated to the work. Absolutely. You know, and I think it has the potential for incredible greatness. Mm -hmm. It could institute a tribal curriculum in a way that we've never seen before. And right. I think it has that kind of potential. Of course, as long as it's run by the state, that's not possible. But right. If the tribe Absolutely. and the tribal yeah. people decide to take ownership or reinstitute ownership, rather, I think it has incredible potential. So, yeah, I loved being there. And... Um, I, I, that's actually what led to, um, my current work. But yeah, while I was teaching there, I was still operating a photo studio out of Seattle and I did a number of different, uh, photo projects mm -hmm. 
independent from being a teacher. So I was teaching and being a photographer and I was also in grad school. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with more Hebulb Conversations. Welcome back to Hebulb Conversations. Today we're here with Matika Wilbur. Thanks again for joining us, Matika. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will you tell us how you got into photography? Well, actually, you know, I was newly sober is really the story. I, I got sober when I was 17. Okay. Yeah, and um, so I've been sober for a long time now, and I just did not know what to do with myself. And I had a really great teacher, uh, Mr. Smith, and he was like, well, what are you going to do now? You know, <laughs> he was actually like the after school teacher at, on the res in Swinomish. And um, I said, I really want to take photography. But, you know, like the school district is I found like to be a very racist experience. Mm -hmm. I, I felt tormented in high school by uh, that strange dichotomy that we still put our kids through, you know, asking them to choose between cultural education and Western education. And, you know, it's very much. Public school for me was very um, one-sided. It was very driven by whiteness, mm -hmm. you know. All of and everybody in power was also white. You know, like the teachers, the administrators, the principals, right. and so I felt very uncomfortable in public school. And when I tried to get into the photography program, they were like, you know, you're rugged. We we can't give you the freedom to. Be, take this photography class because photography students got to like run around and take pictures and be in the dark room and they knew I was up to no good or at least they said so right. I never got to take they photography in high school and so in my senior year I did running start and Mr. Smith helped me get into the photography program at Skagit okay. and then he would drive me there and he set up a little dark room in his house and uh, he bought me film wow. and and I really think that it was that experience, you know, getting to uh, do that. And then also there was this lady, I don't even remember said lady's name, <laughs> but she uh, was a lady that I met in new sobriety. And she was like, oh, you want to be a photographer? I'm going to this photography conference. And she said, I'm going to the Rocky Mountain School of Photography is doing this weekend workshop. Would you like to come? And I did. And it was at this like the Red Lion Hotel in Bellevue. Like it wasn't fabulous. But. I heard this photographer speak while I was there. His name's Craig Tanner. And he gave a lecture called The Myth of Talent. Mm -hmm. And he said that, you know, although we've been made to believe that a person is born with a special talent, we now know that that's not true. Like that the prodigies, the children born with incredible talent, are actually kids who have put in 10,000 hours already. Right. And so he told this story about this young uh, third grade uh, pian pianist that could play like Beethoven and Bach and all of these uh, incredible arrangements that somebody sh in their 20s should be able to do. And then he told the story of how he talked with said student and said student was like, well, yeah, I get up at three in the morning so I can play the piano until I have to go to school at eight. And then when I come home from school, I play for another five hours. And and I've been doing that since I was like three years old. <laughs> and he was like, and so this kid had already logged the number of hours to be a master. And he, you know, kind of looked at the audience. He said, you can be a master at anything you want to be a master at. Right. All it takes is the hours. And I think like for me, something clicked, a light went on like, yeah. oh, wow. Because I'd been made to believe the popular narrative that we so often reinforce in public school to native students, which is that they don't have potential, which is that because you're born um, as a native person and you live on the res, you're disadvantaged. Therefore, you should become a fisherman or drop out. And those were uh, the messages that I heard. And I don't know if those are the messages the teachers told me, but those are the messages I heard. Right. And I heard that man say that and I thought to myself like, OK, well, if I can become a master of anything, then it's going to be photography. Because the next lady that gave a lecture was this National Geographic photographer. And she had just gotten back from like Bali and Bora Bora, which at the time were just like, to me, like the most incredible places. Right. And she had been on assignment. And I thought to myself, like, 
and she had all the things, you know, like the dress and the boots and the big camera and the red <laughs> lipstick. And she was so like the lifestyle and like the idea of it yeah. was so attractive to me. Like, wow, you can travel for a job and get paid to do it and go experience the world. How exciting. So that was really for me that moment when I thought to myself, like, oh, yeah, this is I want to do this. And so I applied to the Rocky Mountain School of Photography and I got in. And then because I had horrible grades in high school. And so going there then provided me like the transition material that I needed to be able to go to Brooks. And so with that portfolio, I was able to go to Brooks and then, you know, like the rest is history. Yeah. So that's like the, the inception story. I love it. <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about your, the, you mentioned it um, in our last segment, the collection of Coast Salish elders? That was actually, it was a good entree for me into the fine art world and long form documentary work. Because prior to that, I had only imagined doing work for hire or work for syndication, which is all very short form documentary. So for me, spending an, hour, uh, an entire year working on a project felt like an eternity at the time. And now I've, you know, I've been working on this project for 10 years. That's an eternity. But that one, you know, like putting together a collection of 50 images that would show in a museum and then I got paid to do so. The tribe purchased them, so then I had money to do another project. It kind of gave me the opportunity to think about doing works that I believe in instead of just work for hire that right. an editor or a publisher believes in. Yeah. And so then I was able to explore identity in ways that was meaningful to me. So we are when people uh, talks with Coast Salish elders, and then I went on to do Save the Indian and Kill the Man, which looks at the harmful effects of boarding schools. And that was shown at like the Royal British Columbia Museum and all these museums around the country. So then I was able to be like a, a photographer that explores identity. So then I did um, uh, We Emerge, which was a collective of different artists uh, like Tracy Rector with Longhouse Media and Louis Gong and Bunky would come out, Bunky Echo Hawk. We had all these really cool native artists and we were putting up shops, pop-up shops around ne Seattle just mm -hmm. because there's such poor representation, especially at the time. Right. You know, like all the curators are non-natives of places like the Seattle Art Museum or that then the Burke Museum of Natural History, all the galleries uh, that are owned in the Seattle area, the large gall galleries that are very profitable are all owned by non-natives. And so there's uh, an ethical is issue there with representing native people without native people in power. And so we decided, okay, we'll make up pop-ups and we'll put up our artwork and we'll curate it ourselves and we'll take home the profits. And so that was really successful. And, and the people that worked on that project went on to become great successes. And um, that after we emerged, I did a project called I Human, and then I started uh, this new project, Project 562. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back with more He Bulb Conversations. Welcome back to He Bulb Conversations. Today we're here with my friend Matika Wilbur. <laughs> Welcome back, Matika. Let's talk about Project 562. Yes. Okay, tell me everything. How <laughs> did you just start from the beginning? How did you come up with this idea? Well, um, 562 stands for the number of federally recognized tribes when I started the project at its inception. I was teaching at Heritage and I was tasked with the force of developing a like a culturally competent visual literacy curriculum sure. and this is before the sense time memorial curriculum was mm -hmm. published and you know if you do a google search at the time for native american portraits which you would come across as a portrait from edward s curtis that terrible man or uh portraits from um a bunch of non-native photographers and most of it would be uh encased in salacious poverty porn you know, dire and debased images of Native people. So sad, so yeah. dirty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I thought to myself, I can't show these images to my students. How is this helping them in any way? I wanted portraits of like Jim Thorpe and um, heroes, mm -hmm. positive representation of Native people that are doing the work to protect uh, native sovereignty and native nation building. I wanted to have conversations about the work that Billy Frank had done sure. or, um, you know, any number of our own leaders in this community and in this society. 
but those types of images belong to the historic archive. There wasn't beautiful, strong color portraits made by Native women, not at all, um, you know, that represented us in a good way. And so um, I started like pulling TED Talks and like more contemporary representations of Native people. And um, there just wasn't enough material. How do you teach our own Native students about what's happening in the Everglades in Miccosukee? or what's happening with Seminoles, or what's happening in Haudenosaunee country. Who are the people that are at the foundation of what is now known as the American democracy? You know, how come we don't talk about that in public school or nationally? And how come it's not a part of the public consciousness is a real, like it's a much larger and more complicated conversation about colonization. But those images and that story should be what I'm teaching these students. And it wasn't available. And so at the time, you know, like I was talking to Ravana and Marina and Shelly, and I, I was like, they were like, yeah, somebody should go photograph all the tribes. Should be you. And they were like, well, you're a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a husband. You don't have kids. You should do it. And so um, you said, okay. I was like, all right, I'll do it. So I put up a, kick, <laughs> I put up a Kickstarter. I and I was like, okay, yeah. well, I'll put up this Kickstarter. And if I raise any money, then I'll do it. And I didn't think anybody was going to give me money to go travel around and take and pictures. And they did. And then they did. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I raised $35,000 in like two or three weeks. Yep. And so then I was like, okay. So I like packed my bags and then Shelly called me and was like, so are you, are you not coming back next oh, year? Okay. <laughs> I, I hadn't like, wait the summer. I hadn't like quit my job yet, you know, because it was so surreal. I didn't think it was actually going to happen, you know? And so I like, it wasn't yeah, real to me yeah. until I was like, you know, packing my bags and like, moving out of my apartment and into I was a like, Winnebago, right? Well, I moved into my Honda first. So I didn't yeah. have enough money to buy a Winnebago because $35,000, while well, it seems like a lot of money, far. it doesn't no. get you very far. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, it was enough money to buy film, to stay in a hotel two nights a week to, and to buy gas. Yeah. That's on a it. budget. It was, I was on a budget. And, I, and so I had to really rely on the kindness of strangers. Yeah. And fortunately, in Indian country, Indians will feed you everywhere you go. You know? Offer so, you a couch so to I sleep didn't on go too. hungry. Yeah. They let me stay. You know, yeah. they they a lot of them put me up in their tribal casinos. Yes. <laughs> I stayed in a lot of tribal casinos. You know, and so um, I spent two years on the road like that, and then eventually I did a second Kickstarter, yep. and I raised enough money to buy an RV, which got the name the Big Girl. Yeah, and I I, I traveled around in the Big Girl for a number of years. And then I got a, a fancier, what we call the bougie big girl because it's a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been on the road ever since. So I started in Washington. I went to Oregon, California, New Mexico, all the way across the country, up and down and back and around again several times. And to Alaska, uh, I've made it, I think, like seven trips to Alaska. I, uh, I've been to about 400 tribal communities. I traveled uh, for nine years. And... I um, I went to almost all of the different tribal regions and different tribal groups, but not every tribe, you know. And, and I realized also that I probably won't ever, yeah. you know. Like I think I think there's like 32 Paiute tribes, and I think after I went to like 15 Paiute tribes, <laughs> I said to myself like I don't think I'm going to go to these other Paiute tribes, you know. <laughs> and the same with Clinkets. You know, there's like 60 different Clinket villages. And I went to about 10 Clinket villages, some that I had to get to by seaplane, you know, mm -hmm. like way out there, like Angoon. And um, and then I thought to myself, I don't think I'm going to go to any more Clinket villages. I think I've been to enough. <laughs> so uh, that that changed for me. But then I also went to visit urban Indian centers. And I met a lot with a lot of uh, different urban Indians, too. And I went to international communities to Canada and Mexico and New Zealand and Australia and photographed those kinds of folks as well. And, I, and I'm really interested in the confluence of identity and politics and sovereignty and nation building and more recently indigenous feminisms. And so that's mostly what the work is dedicated to. So in each community that I go to, I visit with folks, I'd sit down and interview them like this. And Indians are long winded. So maybe three, four hour conversations and, and then, um, and I would film it and, and, um, yeah. You just had a lot of A fun. lot of really great conversations yeah. and met a lot of really incredible people. I bet.
Yeah. And so now we're t I'm taking that. And over the years, I've done a number of different exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did a show here at the Hebal sure Cultural Center. I did a show at the Tacoma Art Museum. I've done shows, uh, you know, like at Yale and Harvard and the Ivies. The Ivies have become friends with me. That's because my good friend, Adrian, who's on my podcast, you know, um, I think advocated for me in the Ivies, but I've done shows in those types of places, Dartmouth and those kind of things. But then also at like regional museums mm -hmm. and tribal museums and and community colleges. And so I've, I've done quite a bit of outreach over the years. Yeah. And what's next? <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to chill a bit, but it's just <laughs> kind of like not in my nature, no, you know? It's, it's just, yeah, it's, if you give me a few days off, I start coming up with a, something to do. <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing a few things. I'm writing a TV show. Uh, well, right now I'm mostly just focused on finishing this book. So it's exciting. It comes out next fall, next October, like the second week in October around Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, it will be a 500 page book published by 10 Speed Press, which is a public uh, Penguin Random House mm -hmm. publication. And so there'll be there's like leading up to then is just sort of like finishing the book. I'm in copy editing right now and then trying to like figure out how to sell books so people can see them, you know, because it's like a lot of trouble to go through if people don't ever see the book. It will yeah. be in places like Barnes and Noble, but if you want to have it in a place like Costco or Target mm -hmm. or like in these other like REI or something like that, you yeah. know, you have to have partnerships with these types of places. So I'm doing that kind of work now. So after all that work, writing the book, publishing the book, now you've now got to, then you gotta out, sell the book. You gotta sell it. You gotta try to sell the book. So there's gonna be like a speaking tour. I'm opening a big exhibition in Santa Monica. Okay. That's fun. I'm doing some public activations in the Midwest and a few different outdoor public exhibitions. And so I have like a, a series of exhibitions I'll do over the next two years and public speaking and like a book tour. We're doing a live podcast recording. All my relations. Mm -hmm. Tell me that, about that. It's exciting. All my relations. Uh, that's really fun. So we have this podcast and we thought my friend Adrian and I, Dr. Adrian King, she's a professor at Brown. She's fancy. She went to like Stanford and Harvard and she teaches at Brown. Uh, she's one co-host of the podcast. The other is Dr. Dr. Desi because she has two PhDs and she's a professor in sociology at UCLA. Okay. And so these ladies host the podcast with me and we um, we were trying to figure out like what to call said podcast because Adrian writes a blog called Native Appropriations and she talks about at, at its inception it was really looking at why mascots are so problematic mm -hmm. and uh, looking at misrepresentations of Native people in public media and misappropriation of Native culture by things like Pocahontas. Um, and so she writes this wildly popular blog. She has like 100,000 followers on Twitter. She does all of these guest lectures all over the country talking about misrepresentation and misappropriation. And uh, so we thought we should do a podcast about contemporary Indigenous identity. And we should talk through some of these big issues because we felt like we were spinning our wheels you know like you're going we're both on the road like i think um so like four years ago i gave over 150 public lectures the year after that i just between the months of october and november i gave over 75 lectures it was like two a day you know yeah. i'm just like flying place to place to place to give lectures and so for us we thought why don't we do this podcast uh, because you can reach more people mm -hmm. in their homes without having to fly there to do it <laughs> you know so we did the podcast and we thought what are we going to call it you know we're not going to call it project 562 we're not going to call it native appropriations what's something that is a part of pan indian identity and that's messy right because tribes are uh, their own sovereign nations mm -hmm. we each have our own unique cultures you don't really want to play into pan-indian identity but the term all my relations is fascinating because almost every tribal community that i went to had a way of describing that uh, that concept that worldview that pedagogy if you will to uh, enhance relationship with one another with land and so, you know, like in Lakota, Matakuyasin, and Lashutsi, Tibakti Eishad, and Cherokee, G, Dagalutsi, there's all of these ancestral understandings of relationality as a way of, um, as a way of 
understanding who we are. Mm -hmm. We understand ourselves in relationship to place, right? The people of the blue green water, the people of the tall pine trees, the people of the clear blue salt water, Suquamish, you know, like all the mishes here, the people of, right, you know. And so we know that there's these ancestral identities and ways of understanding ourselves that's in relationship. And we know also know that the work of colonialism, the settler colonial project is to turn us into individualists. And that's what we do. That's what public education does. We start doing it from a very young age. Um, Western belief systems start training us to believe in individualism. And by that, what I mean is, for example, we'll encourage people to put their children in a separate bed. We'll encourage people to put their kids in preschool, in public education. And then public education, based off of state curricula, will encourage individualism because we'll only measure the success of each individual child. We never allow the child to draw from collective wisdom. We don't give group tests. We give individual tests. We give individual grades. So we believe foundationally as a nation that building strong individualists become the strongest and most successful member of society. And that's why kids that have the best grades go to the best schools, be, do the best networking, get the best jobs, make the best and or the most money. And individualism is what fuels capitalism and like this larger American system and blah, blah, on and on and on we go. But individualism is, in my opinion, a sickness, a great sickness. And it's the sickness of this, what is now known as America's belief system. So without going too far down a rabbit hole, All My Relations is a podcast to recenter ideas of relationality mm -hmm. and to explore what it means to be in good relationship with one another, with land, uh, with water, with our non-human relatives. And we bring on a number of different scholars and activists and uh, public speakers to talk through issues like indigenous feminism, uh, food sovereignty, blood quantum, mascots. Dr. Stephanie Freiberg came on the podcast. Uh, you know, so we've had a, a bunch of really interesting and powerful people to, to help us think through some of those ideas. I love it. You did season two, right? Wrapped up season two. Yeah, we're heading into season three. Okay. So, I mean, you know, like we thought, okay, we thought it'll be so much easier to do a podcast. We'll just like do it in our, in like in our pajamas, like in the basement of some place. It's like a whole production. Oh, oh my God. It's a whole production. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of that. Yeah. But it's been wildly successful. We have over 100,000 listeners. Love it. And um, that's a lot for a podcast that's made by three people. Yeah. You know, most podcasts, I think we're like number 29 in society and culture out of, I don't know, 2 million podcasts. That's crazy. So it's really, that's really special. Yeah. Because, and I think it's because people um, want to, they want, they, there's like a thirst and a yearning for this kind of conversation. And so fortunately, my voice doesn't have to be centered in the podcast. You know, like I get to interview a lot of really cool people and just be quiet. <laughs> so that's, that's the goal. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us today. I've had a lot of fun sitting and chatting <laughs> with you. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh -huh. And we look forward to seeing your book and all of your work in the future. Yay! Yay! Yay. And thank you for watching Keeble Conversations. I'm Michelle Hernandez. Until next time.